I'm Sue Kane, and I uh, teach alongside your speaker in honor today, um, and I have the honor of introducing him. So beside me is Rob Fitch, and I'd like to tell you a little bit about Rob, because Rob has been interested in marine biology since his family moved to Southern California when he was about 10. So in the fifth grade, he started to visit the beach, and he uh, tells me that he was watching Jacques Cousteau films about marine life, and from that moment forward decided that marine biology was going to be his field, and he was passionate about it. He then went on to uh, earn a degree, a bachelor in aquatic biology, from the University of California, Santa Barbara, and his master's is from the University of British Columbia. So he went to grad school and was a program site director at the Catalina Island Marine Institute, and for about three years, he supervised the coming and going of about 15,000 visitors to that site and taught a number of uh, individuals, uh, probably infected them with the passion of, for marine biology, I'm sure. Um, he was actually lured away from Catalina to work here at WVC, and I'm sure you wouldn't have guessed, but he has been here since 1989, teaching biology and a variety of other classes, including our marine biology and oceanography courses. In the summer, he often teaches marine biology, um, and for those of you who haven't had any introduction to marine biology, this is algae and seaweeds uh, are his primary focus. In fact, he has a license plate hanging his door that actually spells out algae lover. <laughs> so at <laughs> Walla Walla, um, he, or he spent um, his summers actually um, as a faculty advisor uh, taking trips over to the coast um, and a number of those field trips uh, some of you may have gone on or are looking to go on and this is the person who would uh, lead those trips over. He's also helped conduct an annual intertidal seaweed survey or did I say intertidal seaweed survey um, project with the Olympic National Park since 1997. So he's attended numerous regional, national, and worldwide marine biology conferences and seminars. And um, personally, he's been married now for 36 years and has two daughters who both came through um, WVC as well. One is now a physician and, uh, I, uh, and another is a marketing coordinator. Anyhow, um, so today's talk is focused on sea farming and uh, aqua or marine culture and um, specifically related to seaweed and uh, marine algae. It's called the farmer in the swell. So with no further ado, I'll give you Mr. Fitch. That was very kind, thank you, and thank you all for being here today. Um, Randy Mitchell asked if I would do that. She's asking a number of faculty if they would um, do these talks, faculty speaks, and so we're asked to talk on areas of the subject that's kind of fun to us, um, that we have a passion for, and here we are, three and a half hours from the ocean, and you wonder, what the heck, sea farming, what's that all about? But as she described, that is sort of a passion I've had for a long time, and I also like humor, so I kind of think, what's a catchy title? The farmer in the dell, well, the farmer in the swell. So the ocean's got swells to it, so it's supposed to be a pun there. If that works for you, great. If not, well, that's the way it goes. So seaweed and algae. Um, most of you, these are kind of rhetorical questions right now, so it's not really a conversation. But what are seaweeds and algae? Um, what are they? What comes to mind when you think of them? I'm asking you some of the same questions I asked during my job interview when I came here, and they still hired me. And so most people think that green, scummy stuff that's over on you know, Sun Lakes, and it gets in my swimming pool or whatever, and it's that gloppy stuff on the beach when you go walking. Now, all of you know what agriculture is. I mean, if you're in Wenatchee for any period of time, this is so key to our economic um, well-being in this area. Well, agriculture means intentionally taking plants and animals that did occur in the wild, cultivating and growing them intentionally for human use, whether it's cotton, whether it's plants, whether it's animals, and we can get more food, more production by doing agriculture on land. So we've discovered that in the ocean there's limited resources there as well. We can't go out and hunt and gather plants and animals from the wild to sustain a human population just through that process. So agriculture is intentionally doing that on land. Aquaculture is doing it in an aquatic environment, which could be freshwater or saltwater, and my area of specific interest has to do in the marine environment. So that's where the word mariculture comes from. Um, phycology is a term you may hear once in a while, or algology. Those are Greek and Latin words for seaweed. So phycology comes from phycos, which is Greek. Algology is algos, which is Latin. So algology or phycology is the study of algae. And you think, geez, why algae or seaweed? Um, this really is my license plate. So Sue is right. It's on my door outside the office. And so when I had enough income to actually pay for a personalized license plate, I got one that said algae lover. So that's what my license plate was in California until we moved up here. Um, in fact, after moving into town, you guys know when you come into Wenatchee from Cashmere, if you don't slow down quickly before you come into town, 
People like to sit there. I had that California plate on my car, and the officer who pulled me over within a few months of moving here because I was still going too fast, what the, hell's an, uh, what the heck is an Al Glover? You know? No, no, it's not Al Glover. So I had to explain and go, so what are you doing in Wenatchee? Anyways, he just wrote me up to get my license changed here. And, oh, you teach at the college. Well, my mom works up there, too. So no tickets. That was rather nice. So that kind of is my biography. So if you're going to be a marine biologist, I discovered you need to learn about the animals in the ocean, which I was excited about, the plants in the ocean, and then the ecology, how they interact. And that was cool. The people who taught the seaweed course I took at Santa Barbara um, were amazing people. One had actually lived and worked in Japan and did a lot of work that helped a lot of the seaweed industry in Japan, some of which we'll see on the slides today, really get more firmly established. So um, he really had a, a working knowledge of what's the economic value of this stuff because he lived in a culture and environment where it was as fundamental to the agriculture and the economy as apples and pears are to the Wenatchee economy. So it's really kind of a big deal in many places. So seaweed, marine algae. Seaweed's a really versatile product. It's widely used for food and direct human consumption. It's also an ingredient for the global food and cosmetics industries and is used as fertilizer and as an animal feed additive. Some of you may have horses or other animals and there may be some type of a, of a derivative from seaweed or algae that you actually supplement your animals to give them because of some of the minerals and nutrients in it. Total annual value of production is estimated at six to eight billion dollars, of which food products for human consumption represent five to six billion. Total use by the global seaweed industry is about eight million tons of wet seaweed. That's a lot of seaweed. Seaweed can be collected from the wild, but it is now increasingly being cultivated, and that's going to be the focus of this talk. It falls into three broad groups based on the pigmentation, the color within the seaweeds, either brown, red, or green, and a whole bunch of variations in colors from beyond that as well. Uses of seaweed as food has strong roots in Asian countries, China, Japan, Korea, but demand for seaweed as food has now also spread around the world. China is by far the largest seaweed producer, followed by Korea and Japan, but seaweeds are today produced in all continents. Red and brown seaweeds are also used to produce what are called hydrocolloids. Colloids are suspensions, hydro means water. They're called alginate, agar, or carrageenan. Alginate and agar, some of you, uh, alginates in salad dressings, keeps the oil and vinegar mixed together. Agar, um, if any of you have taken a microbiology class, the agar plates, that they grow microbes on are made of an extract from red algae, um, alginates from brown algae, and then carrageenan. If you've had any dairy products ever, carrageenan is an agent from red algae added to all kinds of ice creams and milks and chocolate milk, and it's an emulsifier, a thickening agent. It helps keep things mixed together and improves the flow characteristics. So there's wide uses of thickening and gelling agents all over the place. They come as powders. I've got some of these. We'll pass them around to look at a little bit later on. And then I've got just some of these plates. We use these. These are from the microbiology lab upstairs. In fact, Sue, who introduced me, is teaching a microbiology class. And so she and her students are using these kinds of plates to grow and cultivate microbes on a regular basis. So that's a derivative from red algae. And the stuff that we get is going to come from people that you may see in the slide. Today, approximately 1 million tons of wet seaweed are harvested and extracted to produce about 55,000 tons of these hydrocolloids valued at almost a billion dollars. The first time I had um, some international exposure to anything to do with seaweeds was at the International Seaweed Symposium. Believe it or not, there are people that meet together and do this stuff. Every three years, they get together at a different place in the world. And in 2001, um, the college and the foundation provided some funding for me to go to this meeting. And the theme was seaweed, science and technology for sustainable industry. You see that word sustainable? That's kind of a big catch term, even in our agriculture business here in North Central Washington. And it was hosted at the University of Cape Town in South Africa. Seaweed, kind of a definition, said probably about the only natural and renewable resource that's still to be fully exploited by man. So there's the value per year, wild harvest and farming. So we collect it. We also can grow it and cultivate it. And that's where our topic's going to be. China really does crank out about two-thirds of the world's production. It can be very labor-intensive, so places where labor is readily available and not terribly expensive tends to lend itself well to this type of industry. And here's just a list of some other countries, including the U.S. And the U.S. is way down that list on purpose because we don't harvest an awful lot of it in the United States, even though we potentially could. Some demographics. At the meeting, there were 300 participants at that meeting in South Africa from 52 different countries around the world. The good news is international meetings are often are always in English. So no matter where people are from, they have to communicate in the posters and in the presentations in English. So it's the language of science no matter where you go if it's an international meeting. So there are millions of people around the world involved in harvest or farming seaweeds for food. About a quarter million involved in harvesting for extracts like the auger in those auger plates or the thickening agents that we saw earlier. 
So what kind of uses? We could eat it directly. Some of you have gone down to sushi houses and get the California rolls where there's that black and greeny stuff with rice on the inside. And some of you peel the black greeny stuff away and eat the ricey stuff. But actually, it's really loaded with a lot of different nutrients and minerals. Um, one fact about seaweeds is that they don't have the same types of complex sugars in them that pastas or potatoes or rice. So you couldn't just eat seaweed as a substitute for a starch in your diet. They don't really produce a lot of starch. What you eat them for is the minerals and the vitamins that they provide. You couldn't even live off it as a staple, and some of it is rather strongly flavored. So it's a good additive. Um, you can eat it as a garnish, but you're not just going to be sitting there eating bowls of seaweed and hope to get lots of caloric value. It passes right through you, kind of like fiber does. So without getting too biological, um, you don't do an awful lot of stuff with that. It just wee right through you. Fertilizer. Um, it can be used in a number of different places where soils are really poor. When seaweeds have been extracted and the good materials taken from them, the remnants can be added to soil and added um, uh, to nutrient value to the soil. Fodder is for livestock. So aquaculture, um, we can grow animals in the water and feed them seaweeds as well, just like we feed corn to pigs to raise them for things. Abalone is a shell mollusk that is grown as well. Indirectly, here's some of those hydrocolloids or gels that are used. In pharmaceuticals, there's actually a seaweed that grows here in Washington State right in the little marine lab area, the bay that I work at in the summertime, that has been discovered to have anti-herpetic prob uh, properties. That means against herpes viruses. So things like, like those cold sores we get that are due to some of these herpes viruses, there are some agents in seaweeds that have a property of being able to slow those viruses down and stop them from functioning. So there's kind of a whole pharmacological realm that we're still exploring in this whole area of seaweeds. Cosmetics, um, for those of you with lipsticks, blushes, other types of cosmetics, often seaweed derivatives are in those types of products as well to improve their flow characteristics and make them easier to use as you use those. So here's the hydrocolloids again. Those of you with a chemistry background, um, polysaccharides are sugars, fancy name for big sugars like starch. Sulfate, it changes their properties a little bit and makes them kind of slippery and slimy. So again, thicker stabilizers, gels, Alginic acid, again, I'll pass these around at the end. Seaweeds, like the big brown kelp that we grow here in Washington State, is really not commercially harvestable because it grows in such shallow waters, but they do harvest it in other places, and they get these dry powders you can add to water that add as a thickening agent for a lot of different areas. These tend to grow in cool waters, temperate seas where the water's kind of cold. But a lot of the things for agar and carrageenan, the stuff we make these agar plates with or the carrageenan that we add to our ice cream, do best in a lot of the tropical areas. So you can really live almost anywhere in the world and harvest seaweeds and use these types of materials for um, all kinds of applications. Again, in agriculture, number of different uses in agriculture. I'm going to spend some time at the end talking about what's called integrated mariculture, which means growing not only fish, but other types of things in an aquatic environment so that you kind of end up getting multiple crops harvested at the same time instead of just one. So there's some criticism of aquaculture or fish farming because it pollutes the water and so forth. Well, a lot of the people at the international level are problem solvers. When things come up that are problems, they like to work together. What can we do to improve it? What does nature do to improve it? We can maybe recreate nature and come up with better ways of trying to grow food without damaging the environment. Here's that sustainable uh, sustainability idea. In the environment, a number of different seaweeds can be used for bioremediation. That means cleaning things up. Seaweeds are different than land plants. They don't have a root. Um, they really don't have major transport systems to get things up and down through the plant. Seaweeds tend to attach to things, and then the entire portion of the seaweed, what's called the blade or the frond, acts to absorb nutrients like a root, but it's also where photosynthesis occurs. So they're like great big leaves that absorb nutrients directly out of the water like a sponge. They can also absorb toxins and bio, um, uh, biohazards and absorb them and kind of make them so that they're not such uh, damaging to the environment. We can use um, styrofoam. Some of you have seen those starch styrofoam pellets. You put them in water and they dissolve. Well, you can also take extracts from some of the seaweeds and make these styrofoam pellets out of them. And again, they're biodegradable. So instead of seaweed or a little um, styrofoam pellets blowing all over the place, you can have these things that will just melt when it rains. Biofuels, we hear about some of this as well. I was just at a conference a year and a half ago where the focus was on biofuels. As we're looking for alternative energy sources, could we grow algae? And there's literally hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars being invested around the world to look at the feasibility, could we ever grow microalgae, smaller single-celled algae, in large quantities to produce lipids that can be converted into fuels. It doesn't change internal combustion engines, but it means we may not have to rely on fossil fuels for that type of propulsion. All kinds of areas in medicine, I'll talk about this a bit towards the end as well. So there are some properties in seaweeds, um, biomedical implants, many of the pills and capsules you take that are time-release have some type of an algal derivative in them 
that slowly dissolves within your stomach and releases the medicine over a 10, 12, year, 12 hour time period to release that medicine instead of just letting it go all at once. We'll also talk a little bit about some of the medical things being done using gel templates, 3D printers to design body parts implanted with stem cells in an algal matrix to help replace cartilage parts, heart valves that aren't functioning properly, some pretty amazing things that are linking the medical field with the field of algae and seaweed, so stuff you may not even think about. 2007, I got to do the same International Seaweed Symposium that was in Kobe, Japan, and the first slides I'm going to show you show you a country that is considered a developed country that has widespread, incredibly successful seaweed mariculture going on. So we had a chance to tour it out. Many of you have heard of something called nori. It's that kind of black stuff that they wrap up the, the sushi with. And this is what it looks like growing on the rocks. And it grows here in the United States as well. It's all over the place, but they grow it commercially in Japan. A little bit of biology. Here's the life cycle. So what they harvest is a little leafy plant, the thing you saw growing on the rock. And that is what's called a gametophyte. A gamete in biology are the reproductive cells, sperm or egg. And these guys produce sperm and egg too. And they produce them on these little plants that the sperm find an egg, fertilize it, they grow into another little plant that grows on that gametophyte that releases little spores that attach to dead oyster shells and grow as tiny little microscopic filaments that produce more spores that are released to the environment that grow back into that leafy stage. So it's kind of a simplified life cycle. In order for this nori to be successful, it needs to have something to attach to in the leafy phase, and that's when we harvest it. We also need to have empty oyster shells around to complete their life cycle. If there's no oyster shells around, the life cycle of this plant will come to a crashing halt. We'll get back to that life cycle later on. So when this stuff grows, it grows on these nets that are set out intentionally in relatively shallow, calm coastal waters all over Japan. This stuff is harvested by boats like this. This is not a backwards picture. That's the way that the name of the boat was painted on there. So we got to do this tour. It says, Big Catch. So this boat is kind of a funny looking boat with the big metal rails on the front of it. In the background, you see floats. As far as you can see until you get to the mountain range, there are little floats out in the water and other boats. Those floats are all attached to hundreds of square miles of nets in the water that have seaweeds attached to them that are constantly growing. As they grow, these boats come along. And what they'll do is they'll use these bars on the front to lift up the nets. Over the top, there's blades in the top of the boat that will cut the seaweed into collecting bins on the front and the back. That's why it looks all covered with all that black spattered stuff. So as the boat moves, the front bar lifts up a net. The net gets halfway over. The blades cut the seaweed in that one area like a lawnmower. It continues over that net until that part is done. You go to the next patch and you cut and harvest there. You do that about every week or every two weeks. That's how fast this stuff grows, just like your yard. But again, here's the stuff they're harvesting. So it produces little spores that grow in tanks and have great big um, warehouses full of tanks with seawater in them that rear them on shelves. These little filaments grow on shelves that release the spores. To get the spores to attach to the nets, they've got these huge spools with nets on them, and they immerse them in seawater, and all these spores are being released. And the spores want something to attach to, and they do. They take the nets out in the water. Once they start to grow, undo the nets, and then you've got those nets in the water that you saw the boats harvesting the seaweed from. So it's a very sophisticated process. So here's one of the warehouses where all these tanks are full of seawater. There's little PVC bars that have strings going down with oyster shells that are on them. And if you look closely at the oyster shells, there's little lines and threads holding on them. Every one of these little gray spots that you see, it almost looks like there's little gray spots, is the phase of the life cycle that's microscopic that releases the spores that will grow on the nets and grow into the leafy plant that's harvested and used for food. So here are what those big spools look like without the nets on them. And this lady is holding some of the photographs of what those nets look like, kind of red on plastic line that will get immersed with all of these little spores, just literally billions of them, and then they're taken out in the water and released. When the seaweed is harvested, it's a very sophisticated harvesting process. Everything is barcoded or scanned with those funny little things on them that you guys use nowadays when your cell phones to identify and pay for things. The barcodes is what I know, whatever those other funny little things are, are used today. So there's warehouses. Every batch of seaweed that comes in says which farmer produced it. They've all got a code. They grade seaweeds, just like we grade different types of produce. So as you go to one of the apple packing sheds in Wenatchee, apples are graded according to size, texture, color, whatever it happens to be. Seaweeds are graded the same way by people who are experts that do that. The seaweeds are dried, cleaned, pressed, roasted, bundled, and then, depending on their value, sold to the market. And these big boxes are full of seaweeds. So a very sophisticated process. There's part of that warehouse with this showing you the extent of it. 
that much stuff as we went through there, if they stopped stocking the, the warehouse and stopped harvesting seaweed, that's about a one month supply for a fairly large city in Japan. So people in Japan go through a lot of seaweed. At the hotel I stayed at, every meal has some kind of a seaweed product there, either a relish or a garnish or something. It's, it's incorporated in a meal, just like we would put vegetables, fruit, whatever, in all of our meals. So this is what these little sheets of seaweed look like when they're all wrapped up. And you guys have all seen some things like that with the California rolls that are chopped up with rice and all kinds of stuff in them. So again, we can eat these things, but notice it's not the main portion of the food. The main energy we get is from the starch and the vegetables. The seaweed provides a lot of minerals and nutrients that help augment your health. I went to a conference in 2013 in Bali, Indonesia. It's called the Exhibition and the Action of Consuming Seaweed. It doesn't sound very grammatically correct, but English is not the native language to people in Indonesia. So this is called the International Seaweed Symposium again, Seaweed Science for Sustainable Prosperity. So this is a conference where taking things to a third world country that is trying to get its people up to the economic level that first world nations have. So what they do there is they'll take places, villages along the islands in Indonesia that have run low on fishing. Fishing has kind of petered itself out. They can't get as many fishing grounds. People are looking for work. They're looking for jobs. And so people have come in and said, these islands are absolutely ideal for farming certain types of seaweeds. So we went to a tour one day to a village along the coast of Bali where they do seaweed farming. So here's one of the villagers. And on this bar, he's got all these little bundles of seaweed that maybe are about as big as your fist. And these little bundles of seaweed are going to be taken out into the ocean, and they're going to be put onto lines that are hammered down into the sand in a lagoon. So you've got a barrier reef where the waves crash, a great big lagoon that's fairly shallow, and then a beach. So they use these beaches and the shallow water to do the seaweed farming. So he's taken it out towards where the seaweed farming, and there's the picture you saw in that little promotional deal. So here's a net. All these are stakes in the water. Way out in the distance is where the waves are breaking on a reef. You don't want to do anything out there. It's just too rough. And you can see the regular lines that are in the water. So people go out and they will hand tie seaweed onto these little ropes. In about six weeks, they go out and harvest them, and you've got an accumulation of seaweed the size of a basketball. So this stuff grows quickly. So this stuff is really not used for food. This is what's used as the extract to produce the powders for agar and for the carrageenan that will be in your chocolate milk and ice cream. So here's one of the farmers going out in one of the little boats, and he's just kind of punting out in the water. It's very shallow out there. So you need light for photosynthesis to occur. So these are plant-like organisms, so these shallow, calm waters work really well. When they harvest it, they get huge quantities of this seaweed. So this is kind of a harvest that was brought in as we were there with the village. They lay it out to dry along the villages and the beach there. They collect it all. And then the women and the children in the village sort through. If there's a little marine organisms attached to the seaweed, they pick all that kind of stuff out. Then they stomp it down into bags and ship it off to countries where the auger and the carrageenan will be extracted. They get all the water out of it. Water is expensive to ship, so they extract all that water, and you end up just getting the seaweed that can then be processed into these powders and gels that are used all over the world. This is the village we were at, and this village has a resort. And when the tide is up, you only get one high and low tide a day out there. When the tide is up in the morning, and it's hot, it's hot. I've never sweated so much in my life. It's very hot there. So when it's hot there, these are all little beach chairs and vacationers from Europe, Australia, whatever, sit on the beach and the ocean tide comes up, covers where all the seaweed is being done, and you've got this little nice strandy stretch of beach. But after about noon or one o'clock, it is so hot, everybody goes back to their hotels and takes siestas and stuff. And so the tide goes out and then all the villagers go out and they do their seaweed work in the afternoon. So this is kind of a multiple use facility. So vacationers can come out and use the sand and the nice little shore that's there. The villagers may help in the hotel. And then the afternoon when the tide goes out and all the visitors leave, they go out and do their seaweed farming. So kind of a neat deal. Some of the displays of how the seaweed is used. This is a company, a commercial company from Indonesia. And at these meetings, there's displays from entrepreneurs and businesses that use seaweed. So it's used in dairy applications for making breads, all kinds of gels like Jello. Um, uh, confectionaries, candies, um, we tend to think of uh, like jelly beans and stuff. They make the same thing using auger. So the jelly beans have seaweed gel in them, and they still have the flavor. Various meat applications and toothpastes. It's sort of an agent that helps hold all the ingredients together in toothpaste. So multiple uses, even pet food. So there's a nice little dog, and so you can add carrageenan, and it helps the texture of the food for the pets and doesn't affect their digestion at all as well. Just a whole range of products in which you find it. So here's a um, some type of chocolate milk, I think, and there's the carrageenan circled out of it. There's ice cream, body lotions, all kinds of dairy products, <laughs> laxative, so medicines, salad dressings, there's candies. It's even used to help put ahead on certain types of beer. You know, so there's all kinds of applications to this stuff. Oops, go back one. 
If we go to the other end of the application, this is a meeting called the International Society for Applied Phycology. So now we're taking stuff out of the villages, out of the towns. What does the future hold? What are we doing with all this stuff? So the people who attend this meeting are not farmers in the local villages of third world countries. There's doctors, there's people who are captains and captainettes of industry, people who are business leaders saying, what are the business applications? What are the commercial uses for this stuff? So strengthening algal industry for the future, key knowledge and skills. I had to take that picture. You guys are all familiar with the Sydney Opera House, so my wife was smithy, and, and I couldn't. Wherever I go, it's always fun to see the different seaweeds that are there. So there I'm on the beach, and she says, geez, we're at the, Seattle, or the Sydney Opera House, and you're looking for seaweed. So anyways, <laughs> one of the things we got to do is have a meal done by a gourmet chef who took seaweed and gave us a four-course meal. So here are seaweeds that are grown commercially in Nova Scotia, all these green things and the yellow stuff that are really pretty tasty. They don't take salty and ugh, yuck at all. They're actually very tasty. And the, the animal that's being, you know, that's kind of scallop, that's sliced raw scallop. But oh my gosh, that was pretty tasty. Next, we had little pieces of chicken that were kind of thrown into a boiler. And these are pieces of brown algae, kelp, that were kind of seasoned and roasted and delicious. This is emu. Emu are like ostriches, so they're like big birds, and they're grown commercially for food. So this is emu with algae wrapped around it with the nori, the kind of the stuff from Japan. And then it's got tempura and little strings of seaweed in there too. And if you like to eat meat, if you're a meat eater, that was delicious. Even the dessert, it was kind of like some type of a salted caramel dessert, but instead of gelatin, which comes from animals, they used agar. And you can't tell the difference, it tasted delicious. So for those of you vegetarians who don't want to eat jello because it's from an animal product, hey, they've got all kinds of things you can do with, with agar. Here's an amazing idea that um, I found out about in Japan, and we're doing more and more of this. It's called Integrated Multitrophic Aquaculture, IMTA. Let's take this apart. Aquaculture is growing things in the aquatic environment on purpose. Trophic means a feeding level. So if you are an herbivore, you eat plants. If you're a carnivore, you eat animals. Those are different feeding levels on a food chain. Multitrophic means that you're going to have multiple types of organisms in one area. Integrated, put it all together. So over on the east coast of Canada, they've got these big pens and they do salmon farming. If you ever go to Costco and you buy the Atlantic farm salmon or farm salmon at all, that's grown intentionally in these pens where they grow them faster. And there's been some criticism directed towards that business or industry saying it's changing the, the organisms, they're polluting the local waters. So people have gotten together and said, okay, what can we do to fix this? How can we make it win-win? So we get economic well-being, we get crops that are commercially harvestable, we can leave the environment in good shape. So what they've got is salmon in a pen, and they'll feed them foods that are more and more directed towards um, vegetarian foods. Some of the algae they grow can be used to feed them, because right now most fish food that they give salmon is ground up anchovies, and so you're taking protein source, grinding it up, feeding it a carnivore, and they're doing work and experiments saying we can probably feed these animals things that are more algae or seaweed based to reduce our reliance on other types of fish and have more fish for people to eat. So kind of a cool idea. Now these fish make a mess. They produce liquid waste, they produce solid waste, and that can foul the waters, make things really yucky. So what they do on the outside of these fish pens, they have rafts with some type of an invertebrate, a shellfish, oysters, scallops, mussels, that take out what is called small particulate organic matter without being too, you guys know when you produce waste, there's solid waste and there's liquid waste. They come from different parts of your body most of the time. So large particulate waste and sinks to the bottom. Small particulate waste kind of stays suspended in the water, makes it cloudy. Believe it or not, these organisms suck that stuff up, and there's still energy in there, food value. They use them, and so now you get a, crash, a cash crop of some type of shellfish. There's also dissolved materials called dissolved inorganic nutrients, things like urea, which is what you get rid of your body when you have a liquid waste removal in the restroom. So algae and seaweeds love that stuff. It's like fertilizer to them. So they remove that from the water. Down at the bottom, of the shore, and we're not talking hundreds of feet deep, maybe 60, 80, 90 feet deep as long as light goes. On the bottom, you have other organisms, sea urchins, you can have sea cucumbers, you can have lobsters, all of which can be consumed and used by humans as food. So what you get now is one, two, three, four cash crops. You get an environment that's left clean, and you get work for people that specialize in those different areas. It's certainly not a perfect system, but it's a step in the right direction, and places all over the world are getting on board with this type of production for food. So it's kind of a win-win-win situation. Even in British Columbia, the original pictures I took, and I did take them, but I got off a website of this integrated multitrophic aquaculture that's going on right now in British Columbia. So they have salmon pens off the coast of Vancouver Island on the sheltered side, not the ocean side, because they get all beat up by the waves. 
These big cages house scallops, great big huge scallops inside of them that are feeding off that particular matter from the salmon. On the bottom, which is not shown here, are sea cucumbers. And then for those of you who saw the college webpage that was being advertised, they grow kelp as well. And as long as you've got light for the kelp, the waste products from not only the salmon, but also from the scallops and also from the sea cucumbers, any of that liquid dissolved material gets picked up by the algae and they grow at a faster rate than they would otherwise grow. It's just like giving them fertilizer. So you get four cash crops, you keep waters clean and pristine, and you can really bet that Canada is really interested in preserving their, I, know, I went to grad school at University of British Columbia. So a lot of the people who are my instructors and professors and people who are grad students are really, really keen on keeping their waters pristine, clean, and not getting polluted. So if they're good with this, it seems like a pretty good way to go. So they're getting all of those types of things working together. You've heard a lot of me yakking and talking, so what I'm going to do now is end this show, and I've got some little video clips to show you. And what's nice about these video clips is that um, the people who talk have accents that are Irish or Australian, which is kind of intriguing. <laughs> so that's always kind of fun. So let's see what we can do with this first. Today, our understanding of seaweed is verifying their uses in alternative medicine. The Tasmanian biotechnology company called Maranova is a new world leader in manufacturing seaweed extracts and translating seaweed-based compounds into new health products and medical applications. We're catching up with one of Maranova's research collaborators to tell us what makes seaweed so special. So Maranova are um, a unique company in Australia. They had a bit of vision and they started a company based on knowing that there are exciting molecules in seaweeds. And the specific health properties in seaweed that the Asians are excited about and after are the gels. And the gels in the brown seaweed are called phacoidin. These gels communicate between cells and they defend the seaweed from bacteria, viruses and different things in the ocean attacking the seaweed all the time. And that means also when we use them in our body, they start to protect us in a similar way. He explains that clinical trials have demonstrated the therapeutic potential of phacoidins. It can improve our immune system, reduce joint pain, confer antiviral activity, and even has exciting applications for mental health and regenerative medicine. With all of these benefits in mind, Maranova has partnered with other companies to develop commercial products and get the health benefits of phacoidins out to the world. Maranova's products range from nutraceuticals, pharmaceuticals, and skincare products. All these health benefits of phacoidins sound amazing. Are there ways we can get these health benefits from just including types of seaweeds more in our diet? Absolutely, we should be eating seaweed more in our diet. Just like this stretchy nori seaweed that we use in sushi, other types of green, brown and red seaweed species are a great source of nutrients like vitamins, proteins, antioxidants and omega-3s. Sushi is still probably my favourite way of getting some seaweed, but there's a world of seaweed-based health products we're going to have to keep our eyes open for. The woman that was being interviewed headed the conference I went to in Australia and before we got there they had a little promo done that was sent all over the country explaining all these scientists are coming to learn more about seaweed so we're going to take a look at that promo for a few minutes as well, I'm hoping. We will do this, we will do this since that seems to be frozen and we will find it once again. It's a $6 billion global industry. And what's more, Australia has a natural advantage. But so far, we've only just begun to explore the potential of our native seaweeds. It's a remarkably versatile family of plants that can be harvested as a food or as a vital ingredient in medicine and pharmaceuticals. The world seaweed experts gather in Sydney next month to discuss the future of the industry. Sean Murphy looks at what's happening in Australia. The 
ocean is the frontier of our future food production. The planet is 70% ocean. Um, and if we're going to be increasing production anyway and becoming more efficient in production, that's the frontier that it's happening in globally, um, and Australia needs to join that trajectory. Marine systems ecologist Dr Pia Winberg wants Australia to engage with a $6 billion a year global seaweed industry. She says Australia has thousands of species of native seaweed with huge potential as food, medicine and agricultural products. We really don't know a lot about Australian seaweeds because just as we have unique uh, gum trees, kangaroos and things on our continent, we have equally unique seaweeds. We can introduce some unique Australian seaweeds and unique molecules from seaweeds to the world that we really haven't seen before. Is this selection fairly typical? These are some of the more common ones that people might be quite familiar with when they're walking around on our local beaches. Basically we've got brown seaweeds which people are more familiar with um, as kelp. And we've got green seaweeds and things like sea lettuce are quite common in our shore that uh, people know about as well. Um, and then we've got red seaweeds and this is um, the stunning Gracilaria. It's actually what agar is made from. And we've got plenty of species of this in Australia and nobody's really cultivating it. However, it's cultivated throughout Southeast Asia. As director of the Shoalhaven Marine and Freshwater Centre at the University of Wollongong, Pia Winberg has been at the forefront of international research on seaweed. So the one thing that's really unique about seaweeds is the slime in them, the gelness in them. Uh, seaweeds don't have vascular tissue um, to move water around them like trees and flowers do. They have to have a whole lot of cells stuck together with this gel substance that actually acts as a transport, communication and a defence system in the seaweeds. So is this the same product that we actually use to do the algae? Research into seaweed gels could now lead to groundbreaking medical treatments. So we're looking at extracts from seaweed that actually form the structural component uh, of 3D printed parts that we're using in studies for nerve and muscle and bone and cartilage regeneration. At the university's world-renowned Intelligent Polymer Research Institute, Professor Gordon Wallace and his team believe seaweed gels have untapped potential for treating conditions like arthritis, schizophrenia and cancer. Already they've been able to regenerate knee cartilage injecting stem cells in a seaweed gel paste. Those structures contain uh, the patient's own stem cells that are printed using our 3D printers, but that also requires a structural component to encase those cells and to provide mechanical integrity. And these extracts from seaweed help us to do that. We really are just scratching the surface at the moment. Uh, it's uh, exciting to think about the, the, the future, about how we might be able to extract specific uh, biomaterials for specific applications and to tailor those, how those materials are produced uh, for a certain type of 3D printing. The University of Wollongong is also studying the chemical profile of Australian seaweed varieties for their potential in gut health, treating conditions such as Crohn's disease and some cancers. Seaweeds have been shown to have very numerous activities, anti-cancer, anti-inflammatory, antioxidant, and we've found that our no, late, uh, own species are also a source of these compounds. Like We've also got the potential for some selective anti-cancer potential as well. Importantly, seaweeds uh, are able in animal studies to deliver significant improvements in gut health and metabolism, so that means creating a, a gut and an environment where the good bacteria flourish and you can suppress the bad ones and have an environment in your gut that improves your whole metabolic function in your body. All right, so there's just a couple of short video clips that kind of go through and explain some of what can be done with some of these different seaweeds. And so uh, the one gentleman with the goatee was talking about, Dr. Wallace, when he spoke, um, I heard him give a talk, and the first thing he passed around, he says, here, I'd like all of you to handle this. And it was made on a 3D printer, and it was a human heart. So they had taken a scan of a human heart from a patient, plugged it into a 3D printer, printed this out using this algal derivative, kind of this stuff when it's dissolved in water. It's like jello that gets really hard. And it had the texture of a heart. It was really gel-like. And he said, what's nice about these gels is they form at temperatures that are much lower than plastics would form. 
So we can inject live human stem cells into these things where they will start to grow and regenerate and replace tissues, um, knee joints, cartilage, things of that nature in a much, much um, more reliable fashion than what we've been able to do before. So to see the, the marriage together of something as, quote, primitive and yucky as seaweeds with things as sophisticated as in advance as what you see going on um, with, with, he's a cardiologist by trade, and he's doing work with this kind of stuff in seaweed. So kind of remarkable to see how that type of work is done. Let me see if we can get out of this. But that was really part of the context. I have got a couple of the short videos, but I didn't want this to go any longer. If you're interested in seeing some more things about seaweeds and what they're doing with them, there's another video that I've got from Ireland where they're talking to people with an Irish accent. I know you have to listen carefully. But about right now in the United States, we're not doing a lot with it at this point yet. Part of it, we have such great lands agriculturally to grow plenty of our own food. We ship a lot of it out. But many countries that are using seaweeds have been forced to do so because they're small countries, a lot of people. And like Japan, very, very mountainous terrain. There's not a lot of area to grow and do a lot of agriculture. So they're forced to go to the sea to get the resources, protein sources, as well as sources for other types of nutrients and vitamins and minerals. And that's why seaweed farming is so big in those places. But it's been really a privilege to be able to work here at the college to teach classes in this area. But then also, I just want to thank the college for um, the ability to go to some of these different locations and see what's going on at a worldwide and a global scale and bring that back to Wenatchee and share it with students and help you realize even if you're growing up in a small town and you know what agriculture, there's a whole field of aquaculture out there going on in the United States. It's booming. Right now, maybe 20 to 25% of our food is grown through aquaculture that comes from the marine environment. And that number is only going to go up. So there's going to be jobs. There's going to be work. There's going to be research available for people in all different areas to get into this field, whether you're a scuba diver or not whether you're a chemist, whether you're interested in engineering, whether you're interested in the biology of these plants, whether you're a chemist or a um, person interested in pharmacology. Really, this is just a field that's beginning to open up. And so for people who never thought about that, plus the place you get to go to and travel, good grief. I feel like one of those MasterCard commercials. How much does this cost? How much does that cost? Going to these marine biology places and see what's going on in the world, priceless. So um, I'm very fortunate in being able to do something that I dreamed about doing when I was in fifth grade. Never dreaming I'd have the chance to do so much of this stuff and then share it with people who might be interested as well. So thank you for your time this afternoon. I'd be glad to field a couple questions if you've got them. So uh, thank you for your time and attention. And uh, I wish you success. And if I can answer any questions, let me do so. Thank you.